going to bring you on because many people, I heard somebody already in the chat saying that they had either read your memoir or seen the movie Beautiful Boy and that they were so inspired by your story and they just had to hear from the real life Beautiful Boy. So Nick, thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, no, no problem. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, the, you know, the trailer for the Beautiful Boy movie is on YouTube and stuff. So if you all want to watch it, it, it's actually a very good trailer. I will say that. It's very emotional for trailer. No, you know, and just for a lot of people, hearing your story and being able to see it play out on the big screen is huge because we don't often get to hear real life stories of people who have struggled with addiction, particularly meth addiction. So how did the movie come about for Beautiful Boy? Um, I mean, it, it's sort of a long story a little bit, but I'll just try to tell the short version, which is that um, around the same time, um, my dad, who is a journalist and, um, you know, I always grew up really admiring him as a writer. Um, he was dealing with having a son, me, who was a, crystal meth addict and, um, you know, who really struggled to get sober. And so he started um, trying to just write about it because I think that's what he did. He was a writer and a journalist and he was trying to understand sort of what um, was going on with me and, um, you know, what had happened to our family. And so he, it actually started because my dad wrote first an article for the New York Times magazine. Um, I think it was called My Addicted Son. Um, and in that article, my dad talked about how at the time I was um, sober and I was living in a sober living and I'd been writing also because that was something I always really loved doing. And I, you know, like I said, I admired my dad and um, writing was, you know, a real sort of cathartic thing for me. Um, so I'd been writing for some online magazines and my dad mentioned that in the New York Times article. And I guess a, a editor from a publishing company in New York read my dad's article and then read my stories um, that I'd written online and then contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in writing a book. And so I, you know, was interested in that and I started writing my book, which was Tweak. And then my dad ended up kind of separately from that, um, expanding his article into the book, Beautiful Boy. And then when the books came out, you know, it was just this amazing thing where we got to travel around the country and talk about our experiences and you know, it was really a healing thing for both of us. And um, anyway, then a producer from Hollywood um, contacted us about turning it into a movie. And it was actually a 10 year long process to go from the books first being published, first starting to talk about it being a movie to what it actually was with, you know, Timothy Chalamet playing me and Steve Carell playing my dad. Um, but, you know, we couldn't have been happier with the way that it all turned out in the end. Wow. So just from you sharing your journey, you get a call from a Hollywood producer says, we want to turn this into fi to a film. How much creative control or how much did you get over how the film turned out and what was told about your real life story? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it was definitely a collaboration. Um, the director who ended up, um, you know, writing and, and directing the film, uh, Felix von Groningen, who is a Belgian director and just the most amazing person, um, you know, spent a really a lot of time with me and with my dad and with my family and, um, you know, really became like a part of our family. And so, you know, we really trusted him completely. And, um, you know, when he wrote the first draft, I guess, of the script and sent it to us, you know, we read it and right away, you know, we were just um, overwhelmed with what he'd done. I mean, it just was such a, a beautiful script. And there were a few things that he, you know, changed for dramatic purposes. Like there's a scene in the movie where my dad, um, I think the, the, the intention was that it's like my dad is so worried about what's going on with me that and, and trying to understand it. So he actually goes and like buys meth and does meth in the middle of the night. And um, that was something that did not happen in real life. That was like a dramatic thing for the movie. And I know my dad was like not thrilled to have um, that <laughs> portrayal um, out there, but um, you know, we understood that it was part of the process and um, you know, just a, a way of dramatizing the story and um, and the emotions of it were were right, you know, which was that my dad was trying to figure out what was what had happened to me and and you know how I'd been kind of like taken over by these drugs that completely changed who I was.
So when you look back at the movie, what percentage? I know you said, of course, they took some creative liberties. And I could imagine your dad saying, oh, that that part really didn't happen. But what percentage would you say it was an actual depiction of your journey of, you know, dealing with this meth addiction? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was very accurate. If anything, I feel like weirdly the movie kind of went easy on me a little bit because it, it, it got a lot worse, really, than um is depicted in the movie and um you know I, I was sort of grateful for that actually you know and and um like I've been married now for um for 11 years and um you know I was glad that like my wife who didn't know me when I was you know in my active addiction like didn't have to see too much horrible stuff like recreated on the screen and um you know those kind of things I, I feel like grateful for but in terms of the emotion I feel like that was just um really really authentic and really captured um everything that that we went through as a family so even when the sort of um biographical or d details were different um the emotions were were really accurate and spot on and i was even saying the actor who portrayed you he looks like you i mean even now i'm looking at you and i'm like oh my gosh i mean did you guys have any say if he played you at all um, I mean, not really, actually, um, about that. I mean, um, Steve Carell, um, when he came on, which is funny, because I think Steve and my dad have a similar thing. Um, but it was kind of just serendipitous, like, um, the producers had worked with Steve on another movie, and they were looking for something to do with him. And um, Steve was looking to do something kind of more serious. And, and Timmy, you know, Timothy, who played me, um, you know, no one even knew who he was at the time. Like when I met him, it was before Call Me By Your Name came out. Um, so I, I'd never even, you know, seen him in anything. Um, but I do think, you know, there is something that like, even just when we met, I remember just sort of feeling like, oh, we have kind of a similar way of like talking and stuff. And so I think, you know, there was there was that like thing that, that he had that I think was um, just, I, I'm sure for the director, when he met Timmy, he sort of was like, oh, he's got kind of a Nick thing a little bit or something. Um, you, I know you were telling me you even had some similar mannerisms, like you're looking at him and you kind of yes. see a little bit of yourself. Yeah, yeah, it was weird. Like I remember when we all went out to dinner um, during the premiere in Toronto, my wife was like looking at Timmy and looking at me and being just being like, ah, this is too weird. Like I, <laughs> I can't deal with this um and uh and yeah and he's he's such an amazingly talented um performer so we were all, also just super lucky to get him so when you had to watch this so first of all if when you had to watch this and see your life kind of play out on the big screen what was that like um was it hard to watch or was it kind of therapeutic for you it was, I mean, it was definitely hard to watch. And, you know, I had, I went to like a couple of screenings with it. So like one, the first time I just went, I guess, by myself. And then one time I, I went with my sister to see it. Um, and that was really hard in a different way. And then I, I also went with my, my mom, my biological mom to see it one time. And so each time I saw it, it was like, and with the different people I saw it with, you know, there were sort of different things to process, but um, yeah, I mean, it was brutal and emotional, um, but I also felt very kind of grateful for it in a way because, um, you know, I've been sober now for 11 years and, um, you know, I my life is really different than it was when I was like struggling with this stuff. And so it's really easy for me to like get caught up in kind of the daily like stuff about, you know, getting, I don't know, just like daily life stuff. And then seeing the movie, it was such a reminder in such a extreme way of like everything that we've gone through as a family, everything that I'd gone through, that when I came out of it the first time, I remember just feeling so grateful because it was like, we survived all that, you know, and we came out the other side and, and you know, I have a great relationship with my family now and I have, um, you know, great relationship with my siblings. And um, so I, if anything, I feel like it was like a gift to me in a way, because it was such a reminder to just like not sweat the small stuff and like be really grateful for the, the life that I have. Cause, um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, my, my family went through hell really, you know, as, as all families do who deal with substance use disorder. No, what I was going to say that was really powerful. If somebody just put a comment on the screen that said the movie absolutely change their life. 
Oh, wow. That's amazing to hear. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to um, have had the opportunity to, you know, sh share my story and, and to hear other people. I and mean, that was the really cool thing when the movie came out, I got to go on this like tour of like 10 cities or something. And, um, you know, just to meet people all across the country who had um, similar stories to mine, you know, who'd struggled with substance use and mental health issues and who either had come out the other side or were still struggling. Um, but to get to connect with people all over the country like that was such a gift. And um, it really is a reminder of, you know, what a big issue this is, what a big problem it is, but also of how much hope there is out there for those of us who are struggling. Because, you know, you see people who re have rebuilt their lives and rebuilt their relationships with their families. And it's just the most beautiful thing. And to know, Nick, that you survived. I mean, the one thing that you said that, you know, we were talking about this before we came on, you know, in front of the audience that you relapsed or six times, like this was truly a journey for, for you. And if people haven't seen the film, it's still on Amazon, on Amazon Prime, you can watch it, beautiful boy. But how you know, when people think, how did you survive? How did you make it? How did you not give up when so many other people, you know, specifically with, you know, addiction facing that struggle feel like it's helpless, like they're helpless. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, part of it, I think I have to say just was like, I, I mean, not to discount, like I had a lot of support and, you know, all those, I mean, I, I went to yeah, six different kind of treatment centers, whether it was like sober living or outpatient or inpatient. And, you know, the, the counselors that I work with, the therapists, um, the doctors, like I am so grateful for everything that they um, did for me and, and for all of those people that work, you know, to help people with these issues, because there's so much help out there and there's so much support out there in every community. And that's been a really amazing thing to see. But, you know, I also was just really lucky, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I have friends who I have so many friends, especially in the last, you know, 10 years who overdosed and, and died and who didn't make it, you know, and it's not that I did anything right that they didn't do or that my families did anything right that their families didn't do. It just was just luck, you know, and I and I really was lucky that that, you know, I mean, I woke up in the hospital with, you know, a tube down my throat and, you know, um, but I didn't die. And, and there's no sort of accounting for that. But, um, you know, the thing that I've learned is that, um, you know, for those of us that, that do survive, you know, it's possible to live. I, I always thought that if I was going to be sober, have to live sober, it was going to mean having to have this kind of second tier kind of consolation prize life where I was always going to be like missing the thing that I'd really wanted to be doing. And I was always going to have this sort of emptiness in me. And now I know that that's not the case at all. Like being sober, I really feel like I get to be on the winning team. You know, I like, I have this incredible community around me, this amazing um, support system, these incredible friends. Um, you know, the 12 step program has been such a, a huge thing for me and, and I'm so grateful for it. And, um, you know, I think that's the thing that, that having this disease, even though it's really hard, it also um, gives us this community and it also gives us these tools that helps us to kind of navigate not just um, our sobriety journey, but also our like life journey. And that's something that I'm very grateful for. Did you feel also, Nick, that every time you went to treatment that you learned something new? Oh yeah, I would say that's, that's sorry. Yeah, it's absolutely, that's definitely true. I mean, I think not, it was never a waste. Like I feel like each time I went, I learned a little bit more. It was like the building blocks, like we were talking about earlier, like, I got a little piece here that I kept with me and then at another place, a, a little piece of something else. And so I definitely um, don't feel like any of those, um, you know, relapses were, or, or you know, um, treatments that I went to were, um, were wastes of time or were failures. You know, it was all part of this process of getting this arsenal of tools together that I was going to need in order to like survive um, having this disease and then, you know, living sober. Have you ever asked yourself, Nick, what was it about the final time in treatment that stopped? Yeah, I have. I mean, that, that made the difference? Yeah, I think, I mean, part of it, I think, was just that I was so beaten down and so, like, kind of done, you know, that I finally was willing to just, like, 
do anything that anyone told me to do at that point. Like if they had been like, in order to get sober and stay sober, you're going to have to like jump on one foot for a year. I feel like I would have been like, all right, I'm going to jump on one foot for a year. So that was part of it. I, and I think, you know, I really struggled with um, admitting that this, that addiction is a disease. Like that just didn't make sense to me. And I always felt like I was going to figure out a way to like be able to just, you know, smoke pot or just drink or just take pills or something, you know, figure out a way to control my using so that I could sort of make it work for me the way it had worked in the beginning. And um, it took me a long time to finally kind of really concede, you know, to my innermost self that I have a disease and that whenever I put a mind altering substance into my body, this invisible switch gets flipped and it's like, I just, I can't stop. And, um, once I kind of accepted that, then it became a lot easier to like do the rest of the things that I needed to do in order to, um, you know, build that sort of armor around myself to, to stay sober. Why do you think that was so hard to accept? And I think even in the movie, there were parts where you're like, but it, I'm a bad person. Like something's wrong with me. It's me. I'm doing this. And I think a lot of people do struggle with that. And why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I think because in some ways it, it it does defy logic a little bit. Like it doesn't totally make sense. It feels like, you know, if you're able to, um, I just always felt like if I was able to like, you know, I don't know, figure out other things in my life, then I would also, then I'd be able to like drink and use more normally. And so I would like focus on those things. But I think also the other thing was that drugs and alcohol really for a long time felt like the only thing that it ever made me feel okay you know like I just felt like I never was gonna feel like joy or any kind of like um I, I just was never gonna feel like connected to the world without drugs and alcohol I felt like the only thing that had ever done that for me so I would go back to them again and again because I just didn't think anything else would ever give me those feelings but what I've learned is that through a combination of you know the 12 steps um, being on medication, you know, psychiatric medication, I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So I'm on, you know, lithium and Prozac and Lamictal and also because I have depression and bipolar disorder. And, um, you know, I work with a doctor, I've been working with the same doctor for the last, um, even longer than my, than I've been sober, actually like 12 years or 13 years or something. Um, and, um, you know, doing the 12 step stuff, like I said, like working with a sponsor, doing the steps, like all those things have made it. So, I mean, I honestly can say today, like when I wake up in the morning, mm. I feel really good. Like I feel like joy, you know, when like going on a walk with my dogs or going to the beach or whatever, like I, I, I feel connected to the world and I feel connected to other people. And that's what I was looking to drugs and alcohol to give me. And so now that I can have that without drugs and alcohol, like that's is such a gift and it feels like a miracle that's like the, that's Ooh. the miracle that sobriety has given me that's a huge word nick a miracle <laughs> it feel like it's a miracle because at the height of your meth addiction how bad did it get for you yeah i mean i um you know i was homeless um that's the thing you know in the in the beautiful boy movie it kind of ends with this one um relapse where i overdose and um you know the movie kind of leaves it ambiguous after that. But after overdosing, I went back to being on the street and, you know, was, um, you know, was literally like sleeping in a park and, you know, eating food out of trash cans and, um, you know, mixing every drug you can imagine and, and, um, you know, using intravenous drugs and, um, you know, I destroyed every relationship in my life. I destroyed my relationship with my, family for sure with my siblings with um you know I and so that was the other thing is that I also felt like there was no way that I was ever going to be able to like build back from that you know it just felt like I'd done too much damage and there was no way I would ever come back from that and so the fact that that I have through you know working these you know doing what's been suggested of me in the program and working the steps and all that stuff um, you know, it, it really, that's a miracle too. I mean, it just, it's crazy that this thing works, you know, and mm. that's something I would say, like when I, 
um, I'm in a meeting or something and I'm talking to a newcomer and they'll be telling me about their life and all the problems that they have. And, you know, I'll always tell them, of course, like, you know, well, if you just like keep putting one foot in front of the other, do the next right thing, like come to meetings, like work, work the steps, get a sponsor, like your life is going to get better. But in my mind, I feel like they'll be telling me all their problems and I'll be thinking like, well, they do have a lot of problems. Like maybe it's not going to work this time. Maybe their problems are too big for them to actually like get help through this. But then I swear, like, it's not like 98% or 99%. It's literally 100% of the time. If I see that same person again, like two months later, three months later, and they've done that, they've, you know, continued to go to meetings and work the steps and blah, blah, blah. Like the problems that they had have gone away and are, are getting better and are getting fixed. And the relationships they thought they never could fix are getting fixed. And it's um, really like there's something that does feel kind of magical about it. Cause I don't understand why it works, but I have just experienced it myself and I've seen it, you know, work with so many other people, which is great. <laughs> and speaking of relationship with your father and your siblings and all of that, how have you repaired that relationship with your father? Cause we see the emotion and all that he went through, um, you know, even your relationship and all of that. And where is it now? Yeah, I mean, you know, my dad and I are super close. I mean, part of the thing that we got to have, which was like a very special thing that that is, you know, obviously unique to our experience was just the fact that we both got to sort of see the other person's perspective so clearly because we've both written these books. And um, I, it's kind of a crazy story because um, when I started writing my book, um, Tweak, I'd written about half of it and then I relapsed really badly and like was like totally off the grid. And when I finally got into treatment, um, I made this decision. This was like the last treatment center I was in that um, I didn't want to reach out to my family again until I was like really sure that I could stay sober because I was worried about like building up their hopes and just, you know, disappointing them again. So I didn't talk to my dad for like, a, or anyone in my family for like a year. And during that time, I, you know, got sober and I, and I wrote the second half of my book. I finished my book. At the same time, my dad, who'd been writing his book, um, had like a, a brain hemorrhage, um, which was really gnarly and like almost killed him. Um, and so, you know, because of that, his book was put on hold. And during that year that um, I didn't talk to him, you know, this all happened and he was recovering from his brain hemorrhage. And I guess he was eventually able to start writing again. And so when, when, when we finally did talk to each other and I, you know, reached out to him through email first and then we talked on the phone and then, you know, eventually I was like, so, you know, I've been sober for a year and I finished the book that I was writing and my dad was like, oh, well, I have this brain hemorrhage, but I'm better now. And um, I finished the book I was writing. So we sent them to each other and, you know, reading his book for me, it did really change things for me because I feel like, you know, up until that point, I had this feeling like for my dad that he could kind of forget about me in some ways. Like he had my stepmom and my little brother and sister. And I felt like he'd be able to be like, oh, okay, I have like one son who's kind of a dud, but I'm just going to focus on like my good family or whatever. And reading beautiful boy, I saw, you know, that was not the case at all. Like he could never forget about me. His marriage almost broke apart because of my addiction. And I really saw the way that my actions affected the people that love me in like such a clear way. And I think for my dad, when he talks about reading my book was that he always was really angry at me when I would relapse because he had this feeling like I was out there just like having a good time, you know, partying or whatever. And that I was just being you know really selfish which you know in some ways I was but um but it was all about like having a good time and I think for him he got to see reading tweak that I wasn't having a good time out there at all I was like in a ton of pain and I would reach out to the drugs and alcohol to try to feel better again because like I said they were the only thing that had ever made me feel better and then as soon as I started you know I just I couldn't stop and then when I was in my active using you know it was just one horror show after another and so I think it really allowed him to start being able to you know forgive me and um you know I um was able to um you know I don't know like really connect with him through that in a way that I 
to, you know, that I, I'm sure we would have figured out a way to do it otherwise, but that was very special. And anyway, and then, yeah, like I said, then we went on this big book tour and, you know, we had to really like share about this stuff on such a deep level over and over and over again. So I think it did allow us to like really heal in a way that, um, you know, again, I'm so grateful for it. And now, you know, I live in Northern California. I live like 20 minutes from my dad. We go surfing all the time. Um, you know, my stepmom and I are in a great place. Um, my biological mom and I are in a great place. My little brother and sister are like my best friends now. I mean, really, like I talk to them every day on the phone. Um, so, you know, we really have come out the other side uh, stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. Well, I can just see people are leaving um, such great comments. Thank you for sharing your story. I have a family member who's a heroin addict. Understanding and dealing with an addiction is so difficult but it's nice to see someone who came out on the other side, because I do think, you know, you know, Nick, when people think about addiction and some of the things that people do while they're in an active addiction, that can be really challenging because people, family members often don't understand, well, why is my loved one doing these things? You know, yeah, you know I... when you hear that, because I know there are a lot of things that you probably did that you aren't proud of that, you know, that the drugs were had taken over and, you yeah, I know, totally. Yeah, I, mean, I became never... like a completely different person. And yeah, I mean, I stole from everybody, um, you know, and I um, was, yeah, I was willing to do anything to get more money to get the drugs because that was the only thing that, that I cared about. And yeah, it's, I mean, addiction is really confusing as a disease because it's like one of the only diseases that the like symptom of the disease actually like makes the person fight getting the treatment for the disease or something. And so I know, you know, I actually have been working in treatment recently, um, which has been, you know, really great. Um, and, um, you know, because of the writer strike and stuff, it's been really nice to like have something to um, do where I've been connecting with people, but I get it even having gone through it myself. Like when you see people in early recovery and they're so resistant to doing what needs to be done and they're so resistant to the idea that addiction is the disease and that they have this disease and it's a brain disease. And, um, you know, there's, there's a solution, but it takes work. And that's the thing for me that I come to learn too, is that, you know, if I had diabetes, I would need to, you know, monitor my blood sugar levels and take my insulin and be careful about what I ate and all this stuff. You know, there's like work that goes along with maintaining, um, a, a, having a disease and, and treating a disease. And, um, you know, addiction is exactly like that. So for me, you know, I have to do these things on a daily basis. I have to. Like it's my, a lifelong thing. Like yeah, it's a lifelong that's thing. the thing that people think that sometimes you just go to treatment and you're better that you're just somehow cured, but this is a chronic disease, like you said, that you will live with and manage, you know, for the rest of your life. And I think what could be really helpful, Nick, even for families to hear is that you said, I stole from everyone in my life and people don't understand if you love me, why are you doing this? Can you help us understand from your perspective when you're in active addiction, why you even hurt people that mean the most to you? Because I can tell just the way you light up talking about your dad that you are crazy about your daddy. I can tell that. So what is it if you could help us to understand, you know, people? Yeah. Who I mean, I always felt like it was like I'd been hijacked or something. I mean, like literally like the exorcist, like possessed, you know, it was just, I mean, I, I have a brain disease that when I put a mind altering substance into my body, like I said, an invisible switch gets flipped. And not only does it become impossible for me to stop, but I have just this obsession. It takes over my mind and it, it is like, I become like an animal or something where all I care about is, you know, getting more of that drug because it really feels like I always like um this is like a nerdy reference but I always kind of compare it to like G Gollum in the Lord of the Rings or whatever where it's like he's got the, the the precious or whatever and you know for me drugs and alcohol were like my precious it was like I need this in order to survive and so if you're going to try to take it away from me like I am going to lash out at you and do anything to like protect this thing that I need that's going to keep me alive and if I have to like steal to get this, to get what I need to keep me alive, I'm going to steal to get what I need to keep me alive. And yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's like, I mean, the drugs themselves, I think changed my 
personality, but also this disease of addiction that I have changed my personality. And, um, you know, that's something like to, to not have that obsession anymore is such a relief. Like that's something that I, I, again, I, I couldn't have ever imagined before, like that just living without that, without that need to like fill myself up and, and, have without that feeling of like having a hole inside of me that needed to be filled i mean that that is just such an incredible gift and i'm so grateful not to feel that way anymore <laughs> i know and i think that what really makes me think about it too is that you had to treat that in conjunction with some of the mental health challenges you mentioned the bipolar disorder and the depression and i think that people don't often realize that addiction and mental health there's such a strong connection at American addiction centers. We see it all the time, which is why we treat a lot of times. You can't just treat the addiction. You also have to treat the mental health component. And when did you realize there was this connection between the two? Yeah. I mean, it really wasn't until like, I guess it was that last treatment center that I went to when I finally was psychologically tested and I was, um, and I was diagnosed and, you know, it wasn't like I took the medication and suddenly like, you know, the world turned, you know, from black and white to color, or whatever, like it wasn't immediate, it was subtle, but it, it really slowly and surely started to make a big difference. And, you know, I always look at um, addiction as being kind of like a perfect storm, like of, of all these pieces that come together to make someone an addict. Like a lot of times there's a genetic component. There was for me, um, you know, a lot of times they say that trauma, if you've experienced trauma, you're more likely to have a substance use disorder. If you, the young, uh, if, you know, the younger you start using, the more likely you are to develop a substance use disorder. And so there's all these different pieces that come together that, you know, make someone an addict. And I think getting sober and being in recovery is kind of a similar thing where it's like, there's all these different pieces of the puzzle that, that I needed. And it's not the same for everybody, but for me, you know, the bipolar piece the medication piece, like that was a, a big piece of my puzzle. And, you know, yeah, 12 steps was a big piece of my puzzle. Like um, I needed to kind of figure out like, okay, what, what, what are these things that I'm going to need to do yeah, for the rest of my life? But I don't need to think about it that way. You know, one day at a time. Well, um, I know that's it, the thing. They say one day at a time. Cause when yeah. you think it, it is all of these things. So what does your one day at a time look like, Nick? What are the tools that you can share with others that have yeah. been instrumental in your one day at a time. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I, you know, I still see my psychiatrist. I, I used to see her every week. Now I see her twice a month. Um, you know, I'm on medications that I've mentioned. I take them every day. You know, I have to get my um, uh, blood work done like every six months or whatever to make sure that like the lithium levels in my blood are not toxic, you know, all this stuff. Like there's you know, maintenance that I have to do. Um, I, go to 12 step meetings. Um, I have a sponsor, I have sponsees, I, um, you know, work the steps, I continue to work the steps. Um, I, um, I, you know, I feel like a big thing for me has been like getting connected with, you know, nature, a lot of people say that, but you know, I love surfing. So I've gotten back into surfing since getting sober. That's a piece of my puzzle. My dog is a piece of my puzzle. Um, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my family, you know, all these things are things that like, um, and my friendships, I mean, gosh, before I got sober, I had no real friendships and no people that I really cared about and that really cared about me. And now I, you know, have a whole phone full of numbers of people that I can call and they'll pick up the phone, you know, and, and, and I love them too. I mean, that's even, it's not even just about being, being, having people that love me. It's like, I love people. And that is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I also heard previously, you've mentioned that meditation. Oh yeah. Prayer. I want to make sure that people, cause I want to hear everything that you're doing. Cause somebody might glean something for that. Yeah. Has yeah. I mean, that has prayer been a big part for you as well. Yes, absolutely. And there was a little while where I was like do, trying different kinds of meditation and um, some of it, you know, I like, I actually feel like I wish I'd like to go back to doing more of it, but um, it's hard to like keep those practices going all the time. Um, but I, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I guess the prayer thing is interesting because I was such a um, atheist, you know, growing up, like that was the way I was raised. And so then when I started getting involved with 12 steps and, you know, there's 
God and higher power and all these words that are written in the steps, I was really like, okay, this is not going to work for me ever. Um, but when I was so desperate, like I mentioned, and, you know, was willing to like jump on one foot for a year, if I had to, I was also willing to like try reaching out to a power greater than myself through prayer and meditation and, um, you know, doing what was suggested of me by my sponsor and by the, by the big book and everything. And I, it really started to work. It started to make a difference and it started to help me feel connected to, um, other people, like I said, but also like to my, just to be present in the present, you know, to be, um, it's settled in myself in the present moment. You know, that's something that, that prayer and meditation does. That is, and I'm so grateful for, like, I'll be out surfing sometimes and I'll suddenly be like, I'm out here doing the thing that I want to be doing in like the most beautiful place. And I'm just in my head, like thinking about all this stuff. And so that's a moment where I can like ask to, for guidance to like, just be present and to like be grateful for like the, you know, the view that I'm looking at and, and the water and my, you know, um, my friends that I'm surfing with and all that stuff. Um, and it really works. It, it, like it, it, it centers me and it connects me. And it's cool. It's cool how it works. Well, before we let you go, I have two final questions. Okay, okay. One, what is the best piece of advice that you've received on this journey? Um, the best piece of advice, I think in one, I mean, I, I guess I would say that just to, to not give up. I mean, maybe that seems like as kind of a stupid yeah. thing to say. Well, but, that's huge. But I mean, I really, because I feel like, especially in the first couple of years of sobriety, like, it can be really hard and our brains, you know, what we do to our brains, I understand it a little bit more now, but I don't understand it as well as like I would if I was a doctor or something, but you know, we really damage our brains when we are drinking and using the way that alcoholics and addicts drink and use. And so it takes a long time to just even like have your brain um, heal from all that damage and to repair the, you know, whatever the chemicals that, that, that are the things that make the chemicals that allow you to feel, you know, happy and, and content and all these things. So, you know, part of that, like, process in the first couple of years is just like holding on, not giving up, you know, they say don't drink and use no matter what. And I, that used to annoy me, but it actually is really kind of good advice because it's like, if you just hold on, mm. it does get better. And that's the thing that, again, like I, I see it every single time that if you don't drink and use and you do this stuff, like it does get better and our brains do heal. And the you know, good feeling chemicals start to come back. And I mean, our, our human body is amazing, but it does take some time. Wow. Nick, I think yeah. just hearing. Was... Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just looking at people commenting, you know, someone saying they read your book when they were 15 and in rehab. Thank you for sharing your story. I can tell you're making a difference. So what is next for you in terms of writing? I know, which is really amazing is that you've been able to take your own journey um, you work, you've written for Netflix now around mental health challenges. Do you see you continuing to use your experience with addiction and the mental health challenges to impact Hollywood and share authentic stories? Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Um, like I said, there's a big writer strike right now, which is a huge bummer, but um, is necessary in order for us to like get a fair deal. <laughs> so um, I, there's no, no writing for me going on right now. Um, but um, I have some projects that I'm, you know, really excited about that are just in the, um, uh, you know, on, the, on hold right now. I'm, I'm working on something actually with Selena Gomez's company, Wondermind, which is all about like, um, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a pilot, it's a TV show pilot, but it's all about, um, their company is all about sort of increasing awareness around mental health issues and trying to, you know, decrease the stigma. And um, they're just amazing. So I love them. Um, so that's really great. And then um, I'm working on another kind of movie thing that's really exciting that hopefully when the strike is over, um, we can dive back into. So um, any yeah. other books, any other books coming? Books, I, I, that's what I should be working on right now because that doesn't, but no, I, I am not working on anything. But I should, I should. I'll, I'll think about it. I like that okay. you say that. that makes you sense. let us know if you come out with another book. All right, but all right. if you haven't, you know, thank you so much to our audience who've watched tonight. Yes. Thank you, Nick, for being so transparent, you know, 
about what you've been through and so candid and just giving us hope. Tonight, I think that is the biggest thing that many people are going to walk away with is that you have given us hope. We've seen your story play out on the big screen. If you haven't watched it, go check it out. Beautiful Boy on Amazon. And also make sure you listen to this again because there were so many golden nuggets that you shared with us, Nick, tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy. Really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to everyone watching. Good night.